I'm going to start the recording then. So it's 10 a.m. Pacific time. I'm going to go ahead and start the recording. Thank you for joining us for the webinar, Assessment and Repair of a Trail After Catastrophic Damage. The Elroy Sparta State Trail. I'm so sorry. <laughs> My name is Candace Gallagher and I am the Director of Operations and Webinar Coordinator for American Trails. This is our 213th webinar in the American Trails Advancing Trails webinar series. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. It includes real-time closed captioning in English um, and also offers uh, and links for the closed captioning and the learning credit quiz um, and the survey will be in the chat box and attendees will receive a follow-up email from me within two days uh, that will include a link to the recording, the transcript, the resources slide with presenter emails, as well as learning credit details. And I would like to thank our partners of the webinar today that include Camelot Tools, Doctors Elizabeth and Greg Berger, Poly Products, the Trails Safe Pla uh, Passing Plan, Stop Speak and Stand Back, Black Diamond Trail Designs, uh, Presto Geo Systems, uh, Outer Space Show, the Bureau of Land Management, the National Park Service, as well as the USDA Forest Service. So thank you so much to all of those partners. And I would like to introduce our webinar partners for today. We have Bill Beesman, who is a Senior Business Development and Project Leader with KL Engineering, and also Andrew Hefley, who is a Superintendent of Wildcat Mountain Work Unit with the Bureau of Parks and Recreation Management, with the Wisconsin Department of National, uh, Natural Resources. So I'm excited to pass controls over to Bill to get started. Bill, you want to kick it off or you're on mute still? A little technical difficulties. Okay, how there are you? Go. Well, Looks you, great. Very good, Bill. Okay, so I guess um, this is good morning for, uh, to those on the West Coast and good afternoon to those on the East Coast and here in the Midwest. I um, want to certainly thank uh, American Trails for hosting this webinar. Um, we've done this uh, locally, but this is the first time we've done this nationally, so we're, we're happy to have a national audience here today. Um, Elroy Sparta Trail is a very treasured trail here in Wisconsin. Um, in 2018, it experienced some pretty heavy rains um, and resulted in some significant damage, uh, which resulted in closure of a 22-mile stretch. Um, this presentation will, will show the various trail damage and process. Um, and so I'll, Andy is our co-presenter. He represents DNR. Uh, he was our uh, he was uh, he was at there from the start. I think he saw the the rains firsthand, um, and the day he was probably one of the first ones to to see the, the damages firsthand. So he's going to go over um, kind of um, first of all, he's going to go over just a brief history of Wisconsin trails, um, also, and 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 then get more in detail in the Elroy Sparta Trail, and you know, and, and showcase or show us some of the damages that that had. So um, Andy was a very um, uh, vital part of our. The process here. I mean, he handled all the local coordination. Um, you know, he. I think you had relationships certainly with all the municipalities, the the stakeholders, uh, you know, snowmobiles group, um, so on and so forth, uh, path users. So having him as as uh, on the team to kind of um, work coordinate with all those entities and have our design team kind of focus on the design was, was very very important. So with that, Andy, I will let you um, go ahead. I'll advance here. All right, thank you, Bill, and and thanks again to Candace and American Trails for having us, and Bill for reaching out to American Trails to set up this opportunity. Um, just a, a, a great opportunity to uh, highlight the trail and and uh, the work that we had to do, um, and some of the things 
some of the decision-making processes that went into it after we had a, a, a record flood here in the area back in 2018. So just uh, uh, by way of introduction, again, uh, I'm the superintendent of a, a Wisconsin State Parks and Trails work unit. Um, I uh, oversee uh, seven state park and trail properties in West Central Wisconsin. Uh, the picture in my background here that you see, that's uh, actually right from the park I'm located at here at Wildcat Mountain State Park uh, in uh, just outside the small village of Ontario, Wisconsin, not Canada, but right here in Wisconsin. So um, uh, in terms of the uh, state trail system, uh, Wisconsin has a, a, a really nice, uh, and of course I'm a little bit biased, but a really nice uh, state trail system. Uh, consisting of uh, 44 state trails, uh, and uh, which equals to about 1,700 miles of trail across the state. Um, 43 of those are, are rails to trails conversions, uh, conversions of old former railroad corridors into recreational trails. And these trails are, uh, uh, each of these uh, rail trails are open to various different recreational uses. The ones that I manage here in West Central Wisconsin are open to uh, certainly pedestrian traffic, bicycling traffic, and then also in the wintertime, um, uh, winter recreation, such as cross-country skiing, snowshoeing, fat tire biking, uh, as well as snowmobiling in the wintertime. Um, there's uh, three, there's actually uh, only two national scenic trails, a typo there, but uh, there's uh, in Wisconsin, we have the Ice Age National Scenic Trail and the North Country National Scenic Trail. Um, which are uh, span different areas of the of the state and highlight different uh, beautiful areas uh, of the state of Wisconsin. And in addition, there's also one water-based state trail uh, in Lake Michigan over on the eastern part of the state. Uh, zooming in here a little bit, just to give you a perspective um, where what area of the state we're talking about, what trail, right kind of in the center of the screen there, you can see the Elroy Sparta State Trail. If you look at the uh, uh, the, the overall picture of the state in the upper right hand corner uh, shows that we're located right in west central Wisconsin. Um, the Elroy Sparta State Trail is, is uh, connected, uh, a part of four connected trails, um, and that uh, makes up a corridor of 101 miles of state trail that travels from Reedsburg there all the way up to Marshland uh, along the Mississippi River on the western side of the state. Um, and so again, we're focusing on the Elroy Sparta. Uh, trail uh, right there in the middle uh, passes through uh, five different communities uh, and uh, between Elroy and Sparta there. Uh, next slide, Bill. Uh, some fun facts about the Elroy Sparta. Uh, it, it was named as the uh, one of the best 15 trails in the United States. Uh, of course, again, I'm biased, so I think it's uh, number one, in my opinion, and, and uh, I, I think I certainly share that sentiment with others. Um, but uh, we're, we're excited to see the, uh, the exposure that the trail gets. And, and one of the reasons that it does get that exposure is because it is considered the first rails to trails trail in the entire country. Um, and uh, so we set the example and, and thousands and thousands of uh, railroad quarters have now been turned into uh, recreational trails. Uh, the railroad bed uh, corridor was originally established and built in the uh, 1800s, uh, 1873. Um, go ahead, Bill. Uh, it was converted to a trail uh, after the railroad service uh, decommissioned the trail uh, in 1966. Uh, it was taken over by the state. Um, and today we estimate, although it's a difficult to get a, a accurate estimate just with so many different access points along the trail that uh, 60,000 plus users uh, visit the trail every year for different recreational experiences. Uh, the, I would say the premier highlight of the trail is the fact that there's uh, three uh, amazing tunnels on the trail. Two of them are about a quarter mile long each, uh, tunnel number one and two you can see on the map there. And then tunnel number three is actually uh, three quarters of a mile long. And to think about the fact that these were um, built back in the late 1800s is, is just a uh, mind boggling really. And you really have to see it in person to, uh, to appreciate it. Um, as I said, it's part of a, a hundred plus mile um, interconnected system of state trails in West Central Wisconsin, uh, known as the Bike Four Trails. And so, uh, a lot of visitors come and, and uh, we'll do multiple day trips on this section of trail through the area. So to get down more into the nitty gritty of, of what we're talking about today is uh, related to the, 
the significant storm that we uh, suffered back in August and September of 2018, uh, this um, wet weather pattern uh, caused historic flooding levels in, in a large area in the southern half of the state. Um, not only just locally to the trail uh, to here at Wildcat where I'm at, um, but all the way down to the Madison area as well. Uh, there was just significant uh, flooding and, and rain events um, for an extended period of time. It seemed like it just kept raining for several weeks straight there. Um, and so then we were left with, uh, unfortunately, a lot of damaged infrastructure and, and uh, property. Um, so uh, as you can see there, there was damages from Norwalk to Elroy. Uh, well, specifically for this project, especially um, I'm going to back up a little bit, uh, kind of the first, first steps that, um, we took after, after it was safe to get out, um, and the waters receded was that, uh, my, me and my staff had to go out and kind of do an initial assessment. We had to get a really good idea of, uh, what was, uh, take, what had taken place out on, on the ground. And so we started just, uh, visiting lots of different trail sites, um, and really getting a, a picture of the extent of the damage out there. Uh, it was so bad that we did close the entire trail um, to start with. Um, and from there, um, sorry, my uh, office lights just shut off on me. Uh, I'm back. Uh, and so we had to uh, go out and figure out what areas were damaged, uh, if there were areas that were not damaged, uh, were there areas that we could reopen and, and could we do it in a quick manner that would allow um, uh, the public to be able to uh, go back to enjoying recreation on the trail as they had been prior to the storm. Uh, there are many discussions with department leadership uh, all the way up to uh, Department of Administration and the governor's office regarding uh, available funding and, and how to best go about it. Uh, and so the first few steps or within the first few weeks following the flood, um, the DNR Department of Natural Resources, which is uh, the agency that I'm housed in, uh, we completed several smaller projects that, that allowed us to reopen several different uh, areas of the trail. Um, the areas with the most significant damage, which we'll highlight here in, in the next few slides, um, that was then uh, determined that uh, the scope of that project and the need for the repairs uh, in those areas were going to be so significant. The need for uh, engineering repairs um, and the and the cost associated, the anticipated cost associated with these repairs, it was going to be so much that that we really needed to get a, a large capital development project uh, together, uh, develop the scope of that work. Um, and so that is when uh, when the state. Uh, started our project and uh, we put out, uh, I believe probably a request for proposals, uh, looking for a consulting engineering firm to help with assessment and, and design, uh, and then uh, leading us into construction of the repairs. Uh, one thing I'd highlight just in that process is, is the, the, uh, the necessity of documentation. Uh, this wound up becoming a, a FEMA disaster declaration um, and, and part of my part of the reason I had to do some of those initial assessments quickly and, and get some rough dollar amounts estimated uh, was to help the governor's office decide, you know, whether or not a, a disaster declaration needed to be made. Um, in this case, it was is such a widespread, again, flooding event that uh, that that disaster declaration was made, which then kind of triggers FEMA's involvement uh, and then uh, Many of you may or may not know or had experience dealing with uh, FEMA disasters, the, just the high level of documentation and, and record keeping that's needed in that. So if I can highlight one point, it's make sure you keep detailed records, not only of, of the, uh, the storm event or the disaster event itself, but also to have really good records of the condition of, of your property or, or infrastructure trails uh, prior to that. Uh, thankfully, in Wisconsin, we're required to do uh, annual or uh, twice annual inspections on all of our uh, designated use areas. And so we have that documentation readily available. Um, and so that, because um, FEMA wants to know what the state was beforehand so that they're not funding something that shouldn't have been funded because it wasn't caused by the disaster. So with that, um, these next several slides just really highlight some of the, the damage that we faced out there. Here, this picture is a, 
a, a representation of the, the washouts that occurred because of the high flow uh, on the Kickapoo River there. Um, there was a section of, of three of these washouts in that area. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, and there's additional, uh, there was, uh, these slope failures, uh, uh, landslides, if you will, um, that really ate away um, part of the trail, uh, trail tread itself. And so we see these high, high embankments where the railroad companies back when they were first establishing the corridor um, to, to make grade, they really built these railroad, uh, these places up and had really high steep banks. And with that, the amount of rain that we had uh, in such a short amount of time, it wound up just causing these slope failures. Here's uh, uh, just a good representative picture of kind of some of the structural issues that we found with some of our bridges uh, in that damage section that, that wound up in this project that Bill worked on and helped design. Uh, there's 35 bridges, I believe, uh, in, within that damage section alone. So each of those structures had to be assessed uh, for different damages. Um, it was as, you know, this was in terms of, yeah, and here's another great example. Um, the the high flow, you know, the water was probably touching the bottom of that bridge there, uh, really washed out the abutment. Again, these uh, have some age to them coming from the uh, 1870s. And so uh, this picture actually is um, not as bad as this one got because the water got high again and washed out even further. Uh, that bridge wound up being replaced. Uh, additional bank erosion, uh, rip rash, rip wrap getting washed out, uh, or if it wasn't even in place, maybe in some cases, just really... Uh, eroding the embankments. Additional uh, bridge and structure damage piers, uh, another bridge that got replaced just because of the significant amount of damage to the wooden structure there. And here in the, as I mentioned, the uh, highlights of the trail is the tunnels. If you look at the kind of the top middle of the picture there um, is the opening of one of our tunnels. Um, and uh, in the foreground is what used to be the trail. And you can see just the amount of debris that got washed um, from the high slopes surrounding these tunnels uh, onto the trail. And so um, I can't even uh, begin to estimate how many uh, tons and tons of material we removed, but then also the tons of material that we had to add in different places as well. And with that, uh, I think I'm going to turn it over to Bill here. Okay. Thanks, Andy. Um, so, so that kind of is a snapshot of, of, you know, the damages that occurred. Um, just to summarize, I mean, it was a 22 mile corridor and we had, you know, I think up more than 30 sites that we were looking at. So the, the, uh, that was a, a, a big challenge in our design was just getting to these places. Um, so design, um, you know, the, the goal, the goal of the design here, um, to, uh, going in, was obviously to, or was to get this trail open as soon as possible. So, you know, with these, uh, with these damaged areas and the way they were spread out and, and some of these um, um, things that were, that needed to be done, for instance, at the tunnel, the, the tunnels were not damaged whatsoever. It was just the approaches. So, and DNR was able to kind of clear that material out. And so they did some work on their own. And so some of the areas were able to get open fairly soon. Um, Obviously, you know, the more major areas with the slope failures and the stream bank uh, or the, the stream washouts um, needed to take time. We needed to design that. Um, so um, the, the structures themselves, a lot of the structures, uh, meaning uh, bridges, uh, were still in place. Um, uh, so and, and again, realize that this was a railroad corridor. So those structures were designed for railroad loading. And really all we needed to do is bike and ped loading to get the, you know, get, get it open. So our hope was that we could kind of uh, utilize those structures um, for bike and ped at a minimum, or, you know, so we had various levels of, of loading that we, that we looked at. So again, the first, uh, first step, of course, is assessing, um, you know, DNR did their own assessing. Um, we we did a more and you know we we did our own as well, but then did more in depth. Of course, uh, there was forty nine. We looked at all the structures in the corridor. That that was forty nine in total. Um, you know uh, that was a, that was a structure inspection that we did. From that, we were going to develop alternatives, establish budgets, and cost estimates. Our pre-design stage um, that 
the goal of the pre-design stage was again to assess to alternatives, cost estimates, and then ultimately uh, define our scope for final design. From that scope and our estimates, we could then secure the team of funding that we needed. So that the field assessment involved uh, getting, getting our boots on the ground here and really getting underneath the structures, getting some of them, some of them were culverts and we had, we had to go within that. To, to look at all this, you know, these were old culverts that were built by, by stones. So, um, you know, some, there was, we had to go in there to see if, if it was intact all the way through. Um, structural engineering was, uh, was involved as well. And we looked at, you can see in the lo lower right-hand corner, uh, there is a bearing pad that's uh, starting to displace off the abutment. And, and if you're a structural engineer, you don't like to see that. So again, we're, our, our, our hope was that even with maybe you can see that there was some failures at that abutment, but all we really needed to do was open it for bike and ped. Um, and so initially we, we, were, we were hopeful, um, but then um, there, was one, there was one structure that we just couldn't see. And that was maybe one of the previous slides that Andy showed where the, the, the abutment was really in bad shape. So we had a diver go down and, and look at it because we really couldn't see under the water. Um, and, and lo and behold, it was completely undermined and it was in, it was in really bad shape. So we did end up closing that bridge. Um, there was another bridge that was in close proximity um, to that that we, that we ended up closing. And so I think you had to, DNR had to put a detour in for that area there. Uh, this is the spreadsheet that we developed to kind of help you know, all the stakeholders involved to determine what's gonna go into our final design. Um, you know, we used uh, color coding to kind of highlight, you know, different, you know, obviously red being more important. You know, we, we looked at high, high ranking, maybe cost. And then, you know, some things again, D, you know, DNR was able to do in house. So, but, you know, from, from this, we, we then um, were able to, you know, kind of define our final scope. Uh, one thing to keep in mind um, on the FEMA funding, uh, they, they do replace in kind. They're not going to um, um, fund things more, more than, they're not going to do fund improvements. So there were, there were instances where, again, on the bridge replacements, those were improvements. So the, the DNR had to understand that, and, and, and the difference of the cost was then going to be their, uh, their responsibility. So from the design, what we ended up with final design, we had 27 repair sites in total. Um, I, I'm going to separate them out into major, uh, major and, and more minor, I guess. But the major repairs included, as I said, two bridge replacements. Uh, there was three, we call them landslides, or those were the slope failure areas. And then there was a two stream bank stabilization. So I'm going to highlight those. The stream bank stabilization, um, we had Cardinal was our sub consultant, so they were a partner in this design. Stream make stabilization, we, we chose to be a bio, bioengineering type solution versus maybe a hard armor solution. The bioengineering, you know, would, would, would enhance the environment. Uh, that, was, that was the intent on that. Here's a picture of the before condition. You can see that really the whole trail was wiped out in this one section. Here's some sections of the bioengineering the techniques that we did. Uh, there's a J, there's three major ones, the J hook, which is on the upstream end. So it's, it's meant to kind of control flow on the upstream end of the pool or upstream of the slope failure. Uh, the, the boulder cluster is on the downstream end. The, um, the tow wood or uh, root wads is maybe another term we use, um, was, was primarily the technique we used to kind of stabilize the bank. So here's the finished product. Um, you can see that it, you know, we weren't, we barely had the grass growing and, and or the root wads were not even complete. And so it was, it was working pretty well. The, the fish seemed to take to it very nicely. Salt failure areas, again, these are, these were 30 to 40 foot high. Um, as Andy said, these were uh, built by the railroad. And so they were very high and the salts were very steep. Um, 
you know, some of these failures, really, it's not like there was water, a lot of water being conveyed or running over the trail. This was essentially mostly water just falling from the sky. Ultimately, when it got the, the ground got so saturated, it just the, the slope just gave way. Here's a cross section of what we ended up doing. Um, the what we did do some geotechnical engineering um, and slope failure analysis. What we what we uh, figured out was that one and a half to one was kind of the the maximum slope we could do. Uh, to kind of keep to, to get the minimum amount of factor of safety. Um, we would like to have more factor of safety, but these were spot improvements. We couldn't, you know, we had to just improve the, a certain area. It's not like we're going to go improve the, the embankment for, you know, however long it was. So, so we had to keep that in mind. So we, we did get minimum uh, factor of safety here. We used, uh, it was the critical aspect here is we had to use uh, well compacted select material. Um, and then on the surface, we we used um, very robust erosion control measures, um, straw wattles and, and such. This is during construction. Uh, you can see the the um, putting in the, uh, uh, the the compacted material is kind of problematic on that steep slope, so they had to do it in benches, and and so it was kind of done in lifts and benches. So um, on the right, you can see. Um, the straw wattles and, and heavy duty erosion mat. We also used uh, uh, native seeds that have uh, deep roots to it. This is, uh, and, and here's kind of the finished product. Uh, one on the left, you can see that was one where it was actually near a waterway. And so we actually um, had to address, uh, we had to we realign that waterway somewhat to, to bring it out to, to go away from the tall slope so it wouldn't undermine further. Two, dam two bridges were damaged beyond repair. Uh, this, is, this is one of them. Uh, in, th in those cases, and I guess on the lower left, that's where we had the abutment failure. And um, that, that, as we went through the design, that deteriorated um, maybe 100% more than that. So, um, but we decided just to, just to replace, replace those two structures. It was easier to do that than to repair them. What we ended up with was uh, a prefabricated steel truss, um, a bridge. Um, one thing to note here, we we talked about the loading of this bridge, uh, this being a railroad corridor, you know, we should we design this for railroad loading? Uh, that would have been cost prohibitive. Um, the, the likelihood of this ever going, reverting back to a, a railroad corridor is, is was, was minimal, so we ended up putting in. We ended up not doing that. We did design it for uh, truck loading, so that if uh, construction uh, trucks could get over this, or in the winter time, this is used by snowmobile uh, users, and they have uh, trail groomers that have some loading to it as well. Some other repairs. So th those are kind of the major repairs. Uh, just to just to highlight some of our other repairs. You can see uh, this involved some concrete uh, repair, uh, surface repair of the abutments. Uh, we, re we restored them back to their original geometry uh, and then enhanced the um, protection around the, the bases, as well as, um, and yeah, the, the arch one on the lower left is similar. Uh, we, we just uh, uh, protected the, the base of that a little more. Uh, the lower right is is just some areas where we had some bank res restoration, and there's where we did do uh, more traditional hard armoring uh, riprap. That was the design, I guess, going into construction. Certainly, with the construction staging, this was was a big aspect. Um, there was a lot of factors going into the staging. We had, uh, you know, we we wanted certainly wanted to keep as much much of the trail open as possible. We also had um, permit conditions that we had to deal with, um, win windows that, um, you know, like in-stream windows and, and that sort of thing. So there was, there was quite a bit of that. Um, the permits that we had to get um, involved, uh, first we did endangered and threatened resources. And, and so from there, again, like I said, we found out there was a, a few, there was a wood turtle um, at, at the stream restoration. and 
northern long ear bat is is something here in Wisconsin that pretty much statewide. Um, so any kind of tree clearing has there are certain windows that we have to ad adhere to. Um, the waterway and wetland chapter thirty that's the uh, that's what we know them as in Wisconsin. We had a number of that, and of course the floodplain. We ended up with uh, thirteen individual permits uh, through DNR. Uh, four general permits. We also had uh, Army Corps of Engineering permits that we had to get. Lessons learned. Um, you know, we, I think as Andy said, uh, one of the things is documentation. We had FEMA funding involved here. Um, you know, just going back and forth with FEMA was, was something um, that, that uh, we, we learned and it took a little bit of time. And I think if you if you know when this was done, it was right around the pandemic years. So I know they were pretty busy, and I think that contributed as well. One of the things was the historic and archaeological reviews. That was a federal process that went through FEMA, uh, and again, I think just just took longer than we anticipated. Uh, our cost estimates, uh, looking back at our cost estimates, I think we were pretty pretty right on, except for. Uh, mobilization as far as just the fact that this was spread out over 22 miles um, that was that was a little underestimated on our part communication is the key uh, that's what we of course with anything so we had a number of stakeholders uh, department of administration that's who the money flowed through the state department of administration um, dnr was involved our, our partner in construction with yankee and and our sub designer cardinal um, be ready for anything, react to the own, uh, unknown conditions. We did have, of course, things that came up. There was an additional slope failure area, area that was not caught during our initial assessment. Um, so we had to, you know, get, get that into the plans and, and so, and, and modify and field fit. So these things were, you know, you're, you're just trying to, you're, for the most part, you're restoring what's there. So once you get out there, you know, work, working on uh, to, uh, kind of field fit all these things. So here's a short video uh, we'd like to show. Hopefully it comes out okay. Um, this is at the ribbon cutting when we we had we reopened the trail. The trail here is 32 and a half miles long. And you like all year round, it's not just a summertime trail. So the you know, five track routes throughout the whole year. So in 2018, they had a, a big FEMA event here. And it, it's, you know, when I saw the pictures of when that happened, it's just amazing. The amount of work that went in and the amount of work that was needed on the roads and the trails and everything, not only on the trail, but all the community here. So I know that this is a, a big part of, you know, kind of restoring up and putting that forth and hopefully uh, making it better so the next time it doesn't happen. So another uh, crucial part was, you know, it, it's not just the trail, but the landslide. When I saw some of those, they're like pictures of the saw that they're like out wet, you know, these huge slides just came down. So it was, you know, I, I don't know the exact number. Uh, truckloads of material, but that was a lot. When I saw the number, I was really excited. You know, when I was out in the in Pennsylvania last year, there was a rail to trail out there, and, and I had folks come up and come up and talk to me about how life's far. Hey, that you hear the best like one of the best ones in the nation. I said, it is the best one. Uh, come on out and visit us. So this is it's just not knowing what's happening it's throughout the nation. And I'm sure there's some even some international visitors and come. So you know, it's a great opportunity to get on the trail. Recognize local You know, there, we couldn't have done it with without our, our partners and team and all the different, you know, engineering staff, department, administration to get this project along. And it, you know, it took a little bit of time, but I think it's, it's restored better than what it was. That's that's kind of the, you know, one of the highlights of our system if you want to make it better for the people. So, live here, service for all those visit here, John and you, so I hope you have this trail one more time. Yay. So I, I don't know how well that came through, but just uh, the, the takeaways there was, and we feel pretty good that we restored it better than it was. And of course, it's it's uh, the best rails to trail in the nation. Um, so that's the, the end of that. I guess, Andy, you wanted to highlight some of the other programs that DNR has. Yeah, just uh, to... Uh, piggyback on on what you said there, Bill, about the video is just being able to restore it better than it was, and 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 that topic came up um, being local here. Uh, 
uh, all the phone calls regarding uh, questions about when the trail was going to reopen and all that kind of thing, those came to my office and, and uh, uh, I had the challenge of trying to meet those uh, those requests and those uh, questions because obviously it took it took from uh, the flooding occurred in 2018 and it took us several years before we were able to fully reopen the trail. And so it was a long drawn out endeavor. Uh, we have hit many delays, uh, some seen, some unforeseen. Um, but again, uh, a common theme that I would get questions about is, is what are we going to do to uh, help protect the trail for future um, from future events? Because uh, as, as many of us realize uh, these extreme weather events seem to happen more frequently. Um, that that wasn't unfortunately the first flood that I've dealt with since being the the the, the lead of this work unit. Um, and so, with uh, changing weather patterns and things like that, what are we going to do to help uh, prevent damage like this and this extent uh, into the future? And so, it was great to be able to to say that yeah, we're looking at things. We're 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 doing additional protections and armoring where we can. Um, that stream bank. Um, rehabilitation where we use the uh, natural features. I think that was great. A uh, great opportunity to not only uh, repair the trail, but also enhance the, the stream bank and, and the, uh, the waterway habitat there as well. Uh, another one was one of the structures. Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we wound up raising, uh, raising the kind of the freeboard, so to speak, of that structure um, several feet above uh, uh, the uh, FEMA 100-year floodplain, I think it was. Um, and so, again, that allows uh, uh, hopefully to be able to withstand uh, higher waters in the future. So, um, yeah, that was a great point. And, and we sure were glad to be able to uh, do that ribbon, ribbon cutting and, and get people back out on the entire trail. And so, yeah, on this slide here, just a highlight of, of some of the uh, the great adaptive equipment and things that we try to promote uh, within the, the state parks and trails program specifically. Uh, we're all about trying to open up our properties to uh, as many users as we possibly can, including those with different um, uh, mobility uh, impairments and things like that. And so uh, the DNR just, uh, just recently uh, started a outdoor wheelchair program where we have uh, motorized uh, all-terrain wheelchairs, as you see kind of in the picture on the right-hand side there, uh, available for being loaned out at several of our state park properties. And I'm, it's kind of a pilot stage right now, but I, I believe the goal is to continue to expand uh, that offering. Um, and, and so obviously there's opportunities for, for non-motorized access, uh, non-motorized wheelchair access as well. I would designate many different things as, as ADA compliant and accessible that way. Um, many of our state uh, park properties offer adaptive kayaks, uh, beach wheelchairs, uh, cross-country sit skis for wintertime recreation. And so there's just a, a wide variety of um, uh, equipment available just for loaning out for the day even. And, and so we, we look for opportunities to continue to expand that. We're grateful for the partners that we have in that as well. So uh, thank you, Bill, for uh, allowing us to highlight that as well. Right now we have. Lastly, um, of course, we want to uh, promote that the International Trail Summit is going to be here in, in Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin, in 2025, April 14th and 17th. So please please come and visit us, and you can actually see the Elroy Sparta Trail at that point. It'll be might be a little cold at that point, but it should it'll be open, right, Andy? Absolutely. So with that, thank you very much, and we'll take any questions. Uh, great. Thank you so much, Andy and Bill. Uh, we definitely have some questions that have come in, but I do invite attendees to send in any additional questions you may have. Um, and we'll, we have over 20 minutes to, to ask some questions here, so I definitely invite you to share them via the Q&A box. Um, so the first question I'd like to ask is, um, Tommy says that he is in Vermont and they were recently hit by major flooding similar to your situation. Curious if you accessed other funding resources to support the efforts along with the FEMA funds. That's the only funding um, mechanism that, that, that I know of, Andy. Um, the, um, I know I, I, I guess certainly the state, yeah, the state of Wisconsin was the other part. Yep, that's right, Bill. Uh, um, and, and that fund, that FEMA funding process actually uh, takes quite a while. In fact, I don't know if it's settled up even now. Here we are, five years removed. Um, uh, essentially, what the state has to do is kind of 
foot the bill to start with uh, and, and then get reimbursed by FEMA on the back end. Um, but where there was differences, such as where we made um, improvements above and beyond um, restoring it to as a uh, previous condition, um, yeah, the state the state uh, had to make up the difference for that. Yeah, that, that's a good point, Andy, that the, the FEMA funding comes after you get everything done. It's not like you're getting it as you go. Uh, Richard says that here in Oregon, we would have to consider the salmon and other fish in the stream limiting their work window to only a few months in the summer. Was this a consideration for this trail? Yes. Yes, we had we had fish windows that we had to deal with, as well as uh, there was an endangered wood, wood turtle species uh, that we that had an uh, in-stream window as well. So that kind of did affect our construction. We actually started uh, because of the uh, history, arc and history review that was ongoing with FEMA, we started construction on portions of it with the anticipation of kind of getting that in place. Um, however, that kind of got delayed. And by the time we got that done, then we kind of missed our window for the stream. And so we had to push that off till, till later when we can get it in. Yeah, just to further explain that any project that we do on on DNR property has to go through uh, an environmental assessment of sorts. We do a, a threatened and endangered species review, um, and we have to uh, take into account uh, different mitigation efforts that may be needed depending on uh, whether or not there's a presence of, of those species. Uh, and then, of course, uh, yeah, where that stream was uh, is the trout stream. And, and so we worked with our fisheries biologists uh, in coming up with the planning um, that was needed for that site specifically. Okay. Um, Fred said that in one washed out trail section, um, he didn't see any railroad ballast. Was the railroad um, rock, the ballast removed when the trail was constructed? Yeah, we we didn't have I, we didn't find any ballast, right? It, it yeah, it varies from place to place. Uh, to be honest with you, and and what they did back in the '60s, I'm not entirely sure because there's uh, some places on the trail where you go below the the we use limestone screenings as our our trail tread surface, uh, and you go down below several inches of that, and you do wind up running into some old ballast. Um, um, but other places like along that stream washout and things like that, uh, it seemed to be non-existent and, and, and maybe some of that, maybe the lack of that also helped uh, or, or contributed to the fact of uh, those washouts. Um, uh, Fred, or sorry, not Fred, I'm sorry. Um, Desiree is asking in regard to the historic and archeological delays, was that related to a new, to new cultural finds uncovered via the floods or just the general process for the section 106 FEMA's cultural resource review? That, that was, uh, and Bill, you can add too, but uh, really it was just, uh, there were no new finds because of it. It was just the general process. And again, like Bill kind of mentioned, uh, the timing of it wasn't great. Um, you know, FEMA was uh, spread thin throughout. And and so that, and again, we covered a, a huge area, you know, 22 miles worth of stuff that they had to look at different structures and things like that. Um, and so really it was just the general process of having to go through that review. Yeah, and DNR did their own uh, arc and history review initially. Um, because of the FEMA funding, then of course we had to go through the federal process. It was it was just the process again because of the the you know kind of the unique nature of this being having all these different sites over 22 miles. And so what would happen is is they would ask for more information and we would provide it. And so it was just kind of a back and forth. So ultimately, there really I don't think there was any uh, archaeological uh, significant areas um, historic. Um, there, the only thing is some of the culverts, I think they wanted, those culverts with being built with stone were so unique that what they want, we did replace one of them and they had asked us to uh, salvage uh, some of the stones so that that could be used maybe for future maintenance on some of the others. But that's the, the, the result was, that was the, the ultimate result in, in, in that process. Okay. Um. Kaylee, Kaylin, I believe is how you pronounce the name. Um, greetings from Idaho. Uh, that bioengineered solution is very cool. What is the estimated lifespan of a structure like that, you know, incorporating log degradation? You know, I, that was, as an engineer, 
um, going in initially, I was like, we're putting wood under, you're doing this with wood, that's going to deteriorate. And it's not going to last that long. But, um, you know, our, our partner in the design is that they specialize in that. Um, you know, the design life is is similar, if not more than than, any, than the alternative. So uh, that was not an issue. Um, you know, when, when you it's, it's just doing the construction correctly. Um, if, if you have the if you have the woody structures below the water line, then they tend not to decay. And so just the install was was critical there. Matthew is asking if you use an asset ma uh, management program, and if so, which one and to what granularity of data do you collect? I'm assuming they're referring to us on the property, and and uh, that's uh, that, that's something that we're kind of lacking, to be honest with you. So um, there there is obviously some data stored in some of our uh, um, uh, systems. Uh, but really, it, it is kind of broad and, and not very detailed. And, and I think that is something our department is working on is, is uh, uh, incorporating it, uh, you know, even to uh, incorporate GIS information as well. How can we map out our assets and our, our infrastructure out there um, to help better manage that kind of stuff? So, yeah, currently we don't have a great system in process. It's a matter of um, uh, local staff knowledge out there, really. Uh, Zenia says, any thoughts on how to approach not just emergency, but ongoing maintenance? Uh, here in Pennsylvania, we are struggling with keeping up our aging trail network without a dedicated funding stream for maintenance from the state or feds. That's a great question, and I'd be lying if I said we don't have the same problem. Um, we, uh, Our agency just went through a, a, a kind of a, a, a task of uh, really documenting our 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 needs for maintenance and and things like that uh you know our agency is is uh everything is approved and goes through the state legislature and so that's how our funding mechanisms work um our spending authority comes through the legislature uh, additional funding comes through the legislature um obviously we utilize grants we use uh friends groups we have uh wonderful partnerships with volunteer organizations that we call uh friends groups of our properties um, and they help leverage additional funds with grants. Um, but yeah, we, uh, it's just really, it, it takes a lot of work working with our legislators and, and just helping them, helping them to understand the needs that we have out there and also the importance of our properties, right? The, the, uh, the economic, I mean, I, I imagine many of you are, are outdoor recreation enthusiasts. And so, uh, you're aware of, of all the benefits of our properties, uh, the uh, the health benefits, the economic benefits, and so on and so forth, the social benefits. So uh, just trying to paint that picture as best we can with the legislature, uh, asking for additional funds when we can, and, and uh, hoping that we get some of that. And thankfully, we've had some luck with that over the years. Great. Um, Jay has said that you had mentioned that the trails were restored to better than existing conditions. How can we design trails to withstand these types of events, such as wildfires and flash floods in the future, if even possible? Yeah, as I mentioned, kind of as we were wrapping up the, the presentation, it was uh, uh, it, it was a little bit of a balancing act and a little bit tricky because of our funding source, like like we were just discussing is is relatively limited uh we don't have a mm -hmm. unfortunately a, a pot of gold um and so it's it's trying to make those uh, small improvements when we can we took advantage of this catastrophic devastating event that we had on the property and and plugged away at some of those we did uh, we armored uh, some of our piers and and bridge supports and abutments in places where we could that that didn't really have it in the in the past, and so uh, and then again, as I mentioned, the bridge we raised that uh, higher above the hundred year floodplain level, so that hopefully it can take on uh, more water, so to speak, and and things like that. So um, uh, wildfires that's not a, a problem that we deal with a lot here in the Midwest and in Wisconsin specifically, um, but uh, yeah, just again, just slowly trying to. Uh, plug away at, at different areas where we can make some improvements. Bill, I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that. Yeah, I guess, I mean, certainly now, um, you know, th this is an old trail. And so if we were to kind of design a new trail, we're using updated rain. You know, this was primarily a flooding event and, and having the trail next to 
a waterway like that, you know, if we were to design this now, we would, uh, you know, we, we would be looking at much robust, much more robust uh, rainfall data and, and rainfall events. So we're definitely looking at, so, you know, um, our standards now, a lot of times, not only we're we looking at the 100 year storm, we're looking at the 200 and maybe even the 500. And some of the some of the high fills areas, you know, we would we wouldn't have had the slopes that steep to begin with. Um, Mike's asking if you made use of any volunteer organizations for light duty restoration. Yes, yeah, certainly we uh, we use volunteers where we can. Um, so much of this work required uh, heavy equipment and and large volumes of material. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't always feasible, but we did put put some volunteers to work on, on some of the lighter cleanup. We had some uh, we, just associated with those rainfalls and storms. We had some tree damage and things like that. And so we uh, put some to work with that. Uh, we Like I said, we have uh, several great volunteer organizations. Uh, one, there actually during this flood, there wasn't a friends group associated with this trail, but uh, they're in the process of reforming. And um, uh, I like to put them to work wherever we can definitely have to leverage those uh, those folks that have an interest in the property as well. What what was the community on the west? It Was it Norwalk that they ended up doing pretty much that on their own through maybe some Trout Unlimited as well, is, is what I recall? Yeah, yep. The, the the county government as well as the village of Norwalk worked together on some stream, uh, stream rehab right next to the trail there as well. And then actually I had uh, a stakeholder um, who... Uh, uh, they have a vested interest in the trail because of, of their business. Um, they, uh, they also donated a fair amount of funding and uh, they helped do some work to reopen a section of trail as well on the other end on the, by Kendall. It was, it was uh, a yeah. big cooperation amongst everybody. There's a lot of people involved. Oh, thank you so much. Um, Jeremy, uh, Bill is asking if you can share your design using the trees in your repair of the embankment. Uh, embankment. Uh, they have a lot of designs for bio repair, but none with trees in them. Not sure how well that will work for them in Atlanta. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, you know, um, th this design, we, we were just using, we, we were using trees that had fallen near the site. And, and so what you need is an intact root system and, and you're basically just taking the trunks and you're kind of embedding them into the embankment with the root wads or root balls sticking out. Um, so um, it, that, that was, that was uh, you know, the, the, generally that, that's what, what the design entailed. Yeah, we, we did use some, you know, rock or stone, you know, which would kind of control the flow away from the embankment. Um, but again, yeah, the, the, the bank stabilization primarily was, was, was there. Okay. Uh, John says in Florida, where he lives and works, um, managing stormwater is a huge issue. Are there retention area or swales part of the design surrounding the trail, or is the area surrounding the trail generally meant to remain natural or, you know, for conservation? Yeah, I would say overall, it's it's meant to remain natural. Um, obviously, uh, um, the trail consists of a lot of bridges and, and culverts and things like that, and so we had to take into effect, uh, uh, you know, where the water is going to go. Um, but we do not design in general. I would say we didn't design in any um, uh, ponds or swales or anything like that. Yeah, I mean this this area here is is really um, primarily rural. There's really no all the communities in the area, there's really no no growth to them. So it's 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 a very pristine area. So we really didn't want to go beyond that. And we weren't we weren't creating any more impervious or really quite honestly the 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 issue here was not uh the development or the upstream areas. It was it was just purely the rainfall that came. Uh, Henrietta, Henrietta is joining from Manitoba, Canada, and their ATV group is responsible for 106 kilometers of trail used by snowmobiles in the winter and ATVs in the spring, summer, and the fall. Are ATVs allowed on your multi-use trail? Good question. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, there are several. So uh, two parts. Uh, on the trails that I manage here in West Central Wisconsin, 
um, the series of the bike four trails, the 101 mile corridor, uh, ATVs are not allowed on those. Um, but there are uh, multiple uh, state trails as part of our state trail system that do allow ATV traffic as well. Great. Okay. Um, Fred is thinking about um, funding, you know, these repairs and FEMA not funding improvement, but restoration as is. Um, just thinking, wouldn't it cost more to restore some aspects since they were built in 1875? Um, he's asking if you can provide an example of an improvement that became an upgrade. I mean, the the the, the bridges were the bridge replacements were was I think the, a, a good example there. That was because. We weren't restoring those, so that was just remove and replace. I think that was pretty much. I think if that was the only, that was the only instance where we had we had upgrades. Uh, Karina is asking if you can repeat the final date when the project was completed. Oh, I don't remember. It was uh, the, I, I think we actually completed it, what it was, December of 2021, but then we celebrated ribbon cutting uh, last spring. So in 2022, we did that ribbon cutting. Yeah, that's that's true. We The, the ribbon cutting was, was, uh, was, was in 2022 spring. Uh, Matthew says, greetings from Nova Scotia, Canada. Uh, did you do any flood mapping after the rain event to determine the high watermark in relation to your infrastructure? We're still working on that. <laughs> um, yes, we are doing that. As part of the bridge replacements, um, a condition was that we had to do letter of map revision through FEMA. And so we're still working through that process. Great. Okay. Uh, John, uh, this question just came in and this will be a quick one. What was the overall price tag for the restoration repairs? Oh, I knew that question was going to come up and I forgot <laughs> to look it up. I got the uh, answer. You got it, Bill? Yeah, two million. All right. We'll, we'll say two million. Um, you know, that's uh, that's the construction and then, you know, did not include design you know the design aspect of it but the it was i think the bid was like 1.7 and then you know we had of course change orders so it was i'm gonna round, i'm gonna say two million right thank you so much and um was, and i'll yeah. just clarify on that mm -hmm. too uh um that was the part that that you bill and kl were uh, were part of that big fema project there were additional like i said smaller projects ahead of time that had probably an additional oh $30,000 involved as well outside of this project, so. All right, we'll do one more question here from Trevor. Um, were there certain design standard references that you use to design the improvements and ensure maximum accessibility for the public? And also, does Wisconsin have any relevant internal design manuals such as materials, details, clearances, et cetera? I guess that's my... Uh, well, as far as the standards, I mean, we're, we're using um, statewide standards are we, we pretty much relied on Wisconsin Department of Transportation has standards related to roadways that would that would um, involve, you know, um, your, your placing fill, that sort of thing, you know, during construction, uh, as far as, um, you know, just ADA and, and the trail itself, those standards. Um, you know, the, the, they also publish design guides for that through through DOT. Um, the Department of Administration, which is um, who uh, also has some master specifications that we had to use. But I guess primarily with Wisconsin Department of Transportation um, is, is the standards that we use. And now just we we do have internal you know trail design handbooks, but these rail trails are a little bit more uh, specialized and and. A unique more more like a roadway than a trail in a lot of instances and so that's why we did go with the dot's type of uh specifications great okay well if you guys do have any follow-up questions for bill or andy i will be sharing their email in my follow-up email by tomorrow afternoon 
And again, I want to thank Andy and Bill for your time um, and presenting this uh, topic with us today. So thank you guys so much. And um, this resources slide will be shared with attendees in my follow up email, along with the link to the recording and the closed caption transcript, as well as the learning credit details. So again, I want to thank our webinar partners that include Camelot Tools, Doctors Elizabeth and Greg Berger, uh, Poly Products, the Trails Safe Passing Plan, Stop, Speak, and Stand Back, Black Diamond Trail Designs, Presto Geosystems, Outer Spatial, the Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service, as well as the USDA Forest Service. And um, if you are enjoying these webinars, um, please consider donating as little as $5 by texting I'm for trails to 44321. Uh, your donation will go to the Trail Capacity Fund, which American Trails um, runs. We are ramping up again. So we're sharing this information again with plans to open the application portal in early December. And for those that donate, we will enter you in our monthly drawing for a Trail Boss mug, Coast Happy Trails coaster and stickers. And lastly, oh, um, I hope you'll be able to join us for the remaining webinars taking place this month in our Advancing Trails webinar series. And a reminder to subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash American Trails, uh, where you can check out all of our webinar recordings as well as join us live. So thank you again to everyone for attending. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day.